When we first started with computerizing operations for companies, we would typically do something called batch processing, where you would go through a bunch of files, a bunch of records, and just do a whole bunch of things, which sounds really vague and ambiguous. So let's make it a little bit more specific. One of the primary functions that was first programmed would be an operation like payroll, where you would read input in that had been put in from data entry into a file over the week, and you would get, or from a time clock, and you would know the day and time people started and stopped, and it could calculate as it was going in how many hours somebody worked and could calculate overtime. And you would, at the end of the week, have to calculate the payroll. And to do that, you would create a program that ran a batch process. It would open up a file with all the hourly information, read all the information in, process it one record at a time, and then print the check, move on to the next record, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about that type of file um, operation or file handling, because we're working then with a data file when we're running the process, rather than doing something like the guessing game where we had a user sitting at the keyboard and interacting with the computer. A batch process would be set to run, and it would just run until the batch was done, until it went through all of the records. So when you're working with files, you're typically working with declaring a file because you usually have to assign it a name inside your program, which may or may not be related to what the file is actually called. Um, you'll open the file because you have to have it open and have access to it to be able to do anything with it. You'll read information from the file. You'll write information to the file, and then you'll close the file when you're done. A lot of programs are written to just do this, to go through and do things without human interaction so that they will run until they're done. And we're going to talk a little bit in this series for Chapter 7 on file handling about some of the different actions that you do and a little bit about the different types of files and a little bit about the history of file handling. Originally, with computers, and we've gone through a lot of different types of file storage. We use things like paper tape, or more commonly, if you look at pictures of some of the older mainframe computers, you had magnetic reel-to-reel -reel tape. And COBOL and some of the older programming languages were really defined to use this sort of sequential file structure. I first learned to program using BASIC, but once I got into doing file processing when I was in college, I was learning COBOL. And COBOL was an interesting language because before, you know, we have to declare variables and we indirectly declare variable sizes before we start using them. But with COBOL, you had to actually define everything because it was all planned for in a sequential file. And the reason that they did that is because they were actually blocking out space on the sequential tape for each record. So let's say that these are chunks of space on our reel-to-reel -reel tape. And we have a record that would be student ID, first name, last name, address, and phone. And then it would start again. And you would actually have to tell the computer how big each of these fields would be. And this is the whole reason that we had what was considered the Y2K problem. Back in the year 2000, or actually in the year 1980, 1998, 1999, people were really worried that when we got to the year 2000, none of the computer systems would work. Because back in the 1960s and the 1970s, storage was extremely expensive. So while t cutting two digits off a, let's say, birth date, declaring it with two characters like the year I was born was 71 instead of 1971 versus 4, saved a lot of storage. It's not a lot when you think of one person. Let's say you work for the military or some really large company and you need to actually store thousands or millions. That storage adds up and costs a lot. So programmers were, for dates, using a two-digit date instead of a four-digit date. And that caused us problems approaching the year 2000 because we got started to get into where people were scheduling things in 1998, 1999 for a few years out. And they would calculate perhaps somebody's age. 
and it wouldn't recognize, if you put it in the current date as 00 or 01, it wouldn't recognize going into the previous century. And a lot of reprogramming had to be done to handle that. But because it was sequential access, you had to have a specific size block for each type of, for each file piece that was going in. So address would have 40 spots reserved. Student ID would have eight spots reserved. First name would have 20 character spaces reserved. It all had to be blocked out and you had to declare that in the program when you wrote it. And to my knowledge, COBOL probably still works that way, but I haven't programmed COBOL in about 10 years, so I might be wrong. More currently, we're working with hard drives. And that's a much better way to do storage. Because with a hard drive, you have something called random access storage. And so it's sort of like a record player. I know nobody remembers those. Or a CD, which you guys do hopefully remember. And with a CD or a disc or a hard drive, you have concentric circles. Forgive me, I am not an art major. Programmers are not always artists. And then it would break that into sectors. And each sector would hold a chunk of data. And when you put in your chunks of data, you would tend to put them in next to each other. Now, this used to be a problem years ago. Because as the disk filled up and you deleted things, the speed for accessing data would slow down. Because when the disk got almost full and you started erasing things, it wouldn't erase things next to each other. It would erase a file here, a file there, and the disk would become fragmented. And you would have to do something to call defragmenting your hard drive, where you would sort it out and put files that belong together next to each other to speed up access time. But it, it was much more flexible than having to define exactly how big any field was going to be because this would be considered random access. And like a record player, you could ha you'd have a read-write head that could move over these sectors and pick up anything. It wouldn't have to, like a cassette tape, play from one song to the next and fast forward through it. You could go directly to the track or the piece that you wanted. That's a random access file. Today, you're typically going to be and some of this older stuff still exists, but you're typically going to be working with one of three types of files. You're, you're going to potentially be working with a database, a text delimited file, or an XML file. And these are some of the standard ways of transferring data from modern languages. Now, if you're working with a database file, this is very common if you're doing web programming, and there's a whole language just to access data and get data out of there. That's done with SQL, which is structured query language, and you'd use a programming language to pass that structured query language back and forth to the database, because that's the language that the database speaks, and it will allow you to create tables to drop tables, to add records, to read records, to write records. So you would use a specific language that you would pass through your programming language to the database. A text delimited file. What that does is instead of specifying how long a field is going to be, it, it separates it with a delimiter. And they're usually either tab or comma delimited, where you'll get a CSV, comma separated values, we'll have commas between each field, or a tab between each field. XML is newer. This is a markup language that will let you create sort of a pseudo database by using tags. And you can define the table, the rows, and the field using tags that are similar to HTML in that they're in brackets. And those are the three sorts of files that we would use today. So that's a little bit of the history of the sort of files that you would use while programming. I'm not going extremely in-depth into file handling. Um, we've talked about the different operations. Typically, you'll declare a file. And to declare a file, it's like declaring a variable. You'll typically give it a name like input 
file equals, and so this would be your variable name, and you, you just refer to it as input file, and then you'd have my file.csv, and you might have c colon slash slash, and you'd usually have the path, if it's on a PC or a modern computer, to where the file is. And there's a few ways to do it, and it's different in every language, so I'm not going to get real heavy into it, but you usually assign it a variable name that you refer to throughout the program, which is handy if you want to access a different file in the future, then you only have to change it in one place at the beginning where you declare the file instead of every place you use it in the program, which is why you assign it to a variable. And typically you'll declare the file, you'll open the file, you'll perform operations on the file, and you'll close the file. The other thing that you're going to do is, and I'm going to just talk about it lightly, you won't be programming it in this class, but I want to talk about control break logic. Often you're going to need to have categories or subcategories. So usually you are either going to sort data or work with sorted data, and you're going to recognize when a field changes. A common example of this is working with data that is referring to different states. So if you wanted to find out how many coffee shops your company had in each state, you could file a report listing each coffee um, shop for the state. And when the state changed, that would be your control break logic. You'd have a variable that would be set to the current state. And when it, the new state did not match the current state, you do a series of programming steps to start a new page, print a new header. That's your control break logic because it would be, the logic would be changing the program, changing something in the program because a control was hit. So that way you would go down to the next state on a new page. Now I do want you reading this in the book, but we won't really be getting heavily into this because it's kind of language dependent. Um, we will do some file handling, but we aren't going to really get into control break programming in this chapter.